The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you to the 12th collection of entries from website subscribers for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. I am just really getting jazzed about this. We are kind of heading towards the end. This is the 12th out of 16 of these collections, and every one of them has been really diverting, varied, interesting people with different approaches, and whatever the experience level, it's always some fascinating ideas that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, beginning with Lazi here and, and his score, like Lazi, you have a really <laughs> terrifically exciting, interesting score. So it's just up to me to help guide you and, you know, to let you know what might work better than what else. And my general thoughts about your um, your orchestration style and some other pointers that I can give you. So <clears throat> I've started off a lot of these uh, a lot of these evaluations with a discussion of the role of the harp and so on. Now we we don't have that so much as a um, as a concern here, about the only thing, you know, I'm sort of thinking to myself about your about your timpani scoring, it's really really present, um, and I'll probably have some more things to say about it as we go, uh, but for now, I think we should start off just by jumping straight in to the evaluation criteria that were listed at the beginning of this video. So the first one is that the pitch weight is in the upper register of the piano. That's not a concern here. You didn't tr transcribe that information directly onto your score. You have a hugely wide uh, picture, timbral picture, going all the way up from very high notes in the piccolo down to very low notes in the double bass. In fact, if, if there's anything I would say about it is that that picture stays big <laughs> for the entire uh, for the entire passage and uh, I'm wondering if there's any possible benefit to having a little bit of restraint from time to time like maybe what if the opening were a little bit less uh, a little less intense and then the and then you like brought on the intensity more later on, right? If this is there some way of having some kind of difference between these two, because that's the next evaluation criterion, which is uh, thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way twice, right? So in essence, just kind of looking at the way that this is scored, it's pretty much just four pairs of times more or less. I mean, there are some differences, right? A few notes difference here and there. But generally speaking, it's just basically kind of the same thing um, 
back and forth. Now, I'm, I'm looking at some of the differences, of course, like, like these low notes right in here, in the horns and so on. That all helps to, um, to change things around. But it's still, you know, essentially, like to the listener, to the casual listener, uh, there, there really won't be much of a difference between the first four bars and then bars 9 through 12. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to do what you did, but more just like as a sort of a challenge, right? If you were to come back to this material, what possible things could you bring to it? Like, is there any way of, of making and making the second group of four bars build on what, what, what happened in the first four bars. Now, having said all of that, let's just really look at <clears throat> a lot of the scoring in here and the implications and so on. So right here, you are scoring a fortissimo note for the bass drum along with cymbal. And your, um, your sound set is not really telling you the truth about this. If a concert bass drum is hit at fortissimo, it will really basically just blank out. You know, it will... Well, what is it that uh, Walter Piston said? It doesn't matter what else is playing at the same time, you're not going to really hear much else but that bass drum. So I think there are certain... That, that's just one of several places in this where the there's a bit of an imbalance uh, in dynamically, right? Um, you have certain parts that are very, very loud and bright, uh, and and other other parts that that could do with a lot of doubling and support and so on that are not getting it. So, uh, and I mean, one of those is like this wonderful thing that you do in here, right in here. I mean, there. I'm just wondering why there couldn't have been other instruments that could have doubled some of these lovely lines here in the middle strings and why that could not have returned later on. You know what I mean? Um, to me, that's like some of the most interesting scoring right in there. And I, I really feel it's absence right in here. If there's a difference between these two parts, it would be that absence of that part that I want to hear more of, right? <clears throat> but it's, it's, in the mock-up, it's barely audible, but looking at it on the screen with, with my inner ear, it's just really a great idea. So, you know, uh, what is what is being used here that possibly could double some of these lines, um, like maybe clarinet, uh, bass clarinet? I love these rising octaves here. Uh, bom, 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 bom. Okay, now here, you're on a little riskier territory, right? You are playing these octaves, going up to B here, which is playable, and B here, which is playable. But it, uh, the, the problem is not whether or not it's playable. The problem is whether or not it will dominate the entire sound picture, right? Like whether, like, it, once again, the, um, the sound set is sort of lying to you a little bit because fortissimo high B on, uh, on a trombone and on a, then on a trumpet will will be hugely loud. will just really cut through everything. Um, it'll just, you know, I mean, and it's a beautiful, heroic sound. So, um, you know, the what I am hearing in the mock-up does not begin to express how loud that will be. And, and you, you know, the, the problem there is that maybe that's something that you don't want, right? So you have to, you have to just, watch out for that kind of thing. Um, there are, of course, you know, the mock-ups are becoming the bread and butter, really, of, of, of this kind of business, right? There, there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work out there that is getting approved because of, you know, because of mock-ups and so on. So, and yet our reliance on them may be like leading to bad habits or unbalanced scoring. So, um, yeah, you know, like a kind of an indication of that is you're right here. You've got this English horn part right in here, um, which is essentially doubling what's going on in the trumpets and trombones and then uh, playing an octave below them. 
So I just feel that the strength of the trumpets and trombones in those rising B octaves is going to be so powerful that it is just going to blow the the English horn part out of the water. And if it's going to do that anyways, why can't the English horn double some of this stuff, right? And and so on. So, you know, it's that, and, and you know, the same thing uh, to an extent is true of the bass clarinet. Uh, but I would say uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps more the second time, right? Um, you know, and, and if that's going to be true of the bass clarinet, why can't the bass clarinet double this part in the cello and strengthen it? Now, um, as far as like doubling the pitches to make them sound fatter and so on, like you're kind of doing here with these wind instruments, wouldn't it be better to like have a two trombones? Like, or actually, like right on this pitch, you have two trombones, you have um, or not two trombones, but you have two brass instruments, but you could still go A2 to A2, A4 then, adding the, the two trumpets, and then so on, right? So, I mean, I wouldn't take the A2 too high, because then you could end up with cracking, and it just, it doesn't sound the same way that it would, say, in a jazz score. But, yeah, um, anyways, I don't want to get stuck on this one point too much, but I mean, generally speaking, it's it's a really exciting score, and I really love these these, these little flurries in the piccolo and the first violins and so on. Briamp, yamp, briamp, yamp. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so down bow marks on the piccolo. All right, watch out. And then here, I would say on accented staccato, a down bow is the wrong kind of thing to mark because uh, the, the, ar the articulation style should be uh, should be tenuto marks, not accented staccato, right? Because the the um, the down bow is a is like just a, a row of down bows is like going zoom zoom zoom, right? And um, the problem with scoring eighth notes at this tempo um, and having them all be down bows is that there needs to be recovery time. So you're going zoom 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 zoom, and that just really is is you know how fast can the how fast can the player return their bow up to the frog every single time, right? And play this um, at that speed. So I feel that like not only is the articulation style wrong, it's just so fast to do a row of all down bows. I, I think that, you know, a row of down bows on quarter notes, that's, that is conceivable, but like on, because basically the, the, the bowing, will only really get the length of a 16th note before it has to return on a silent upstroke that takes the length of a 16th, right? So at, at the best, you would get shorter strokes. Zoom, 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 is what it would sort of sound like, right? And and that isn't that isn't uh, accented staccato by any means. So just, just leave the Boeing decisions in this case to the concert master. Now, let's say that this Boeing style was all right, you wouldn't need to mark it over and over and over and over again. I would just say mark it once and then say simile, like or sim, S-I-M, period, the second time. And then the, they'll just understand to use that same style for the rest of the piece. Okay, <laughs> so <clears throat> that's just, you know, this this is such big, thick scoring. There's so much I like about it. Like, I love the, the rhythm patterns. I think they're really cool. The castanets and the tambourine, you know, um... It just has this wonderful rhythm to it and, and, you know, very nicely realized. Okay, so we're getting to the next part here, which is melodic development soaring quite high and the accompaniment figures covering a wide range of pitches and registers. So I say right in here that like, like the, okay, so one of the problems is that you have got the wrong bass, right? So, I mean, if you if you intend to change the context of the harmony... Then, then I understand, right? But the um, it, it's it, it almost feels like you read the left hand of the piano score and thought that um, you know interpreted it, it as bass clef, right? But the piano score is in treble clef in the left hand, so this would be an E and an A and then an E again, right? So E covering an E octave and a fifth and then A covering an A octave and a fourth, right? So like a sort of a D 
kind of a D minor sort of a harmony. So yeah, I'm just, just wondering if that was a misinterpretation, like looking at the piano score and so on. Um, which is one reason why I really urge people to try to use my uh, try to use my materials, my resources, the um, if if it's possible to import the MIDI data, uh, the music XML, or or to use the Sibelius template score, um, then please use it. Right, so so we don't run into possible errors like this. Now, I don't know if this was an error. You know, maybe I mean this really seems to be a realization. It's like the same pitches in terms of lines and spaces that you see in the left hand, but it's written in the bass clef, right? So instead of this being an E octave, this is a G octave, um, like two octaves lower. So um, yeah, so that, so I would say just fix that, right? If this, if that was an unintentional problem, then you're changing it back to E and then A with a D in the middle and so on would really help this a lot. But but the, the main problem, I feel, is not so much that, it's that the um, the sort of leaping figure that is in this, you know, inherent in this transcription of the piano left hand, is is, is a bit absent, right? That we've got we've got a little bit of it, you know, we've got the bassoons here and we've got the middle strings, but I feel that there needs to be even more action, right? And and the I, I don't think that you can confuse this. I think that it really needs to be the same pitches. Like here you go. Um, G, 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 D, and here you go, G, 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 D, right? So, so like you sort of change the, it's, a, it, and it, it kind, of, kind of, it, it takes away the, the impulsive energy of it when it, when it gets spread out like that in terms of the harmony. So maybe that was a, an error or something. Maybe you intended to come back to the D earlier. So I feel that here you have to really follow the outline of the accompaniment and go up to you know, go up an octave and come back and then up a fifth, right? Instead of going up an octave and then staying on that note and coming back down. Um, I just feel it, like, you know, that bum, 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 it just really kind of needs that impulse, right? So I would say more doubling of the accompaniment figure and, and you know, in, in a more active, aggressive way. Because you have so much support on the on the melody right it's like everybody's doing the melody da 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 ba da ba 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 you know you've got bits and pieces trading off in the brass which is fine and you got your clarinets involved and flutes and and piccolo and so on and i think this is all done really nicely except right here uh, i don't know why this is reversed on the stems but right here the uh, um i don't know if you need to go all the way up to d here you could and d and c you could drop the D and C an octave lower and just let the piccolo do the work up there. Now, one thing that I'm sure everybody noticed is that at this point, you've got ya da 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 This, the dropout of the strings can really be heard here. Then when you go to pizzicato, pluck, 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 pluck. So this pizzicato can barely be heard. Right, it just really has very little in the way of projection compared to the awesome power of the of the brass right in here. The brass will just blow the pizzicato out of the water. Right, even you know you're taking it back to forte, then but then you have a crescendo to fortissimo and so on. So the pizzicato really gets buried in here in terms of effectiveness. So I mean, it would be twice as strong if it were played staccato arco. Right. And then we've already looked at this kind of by looking at this. All right, now here, um, I really regret the absence of the uh, of the accompaniment pattern. And you have instruments that could easily supply it, right? Uh, but yeah, you just have this huge um, quadruple octave. Is how how yeah? It's just just really covering. A lot of octaves. So, I mean, I'd say like in the execution of the melody so far, like solving the problem of the melodic development soaring quite high, that's that's all done pretty well. So right in here, I really like the idea of A2 bassoons, uh, French horns doubling that, and cellos working together. That's That's a very, very solid lower line. So the problem is that you're kind of like 
losing you're putting a, a lot of weight on the very bottom line and and not very much support on the next two lines up and then you come in you come cruising in with a really just very very heavy uh trip quadruple octave this time or quintuple octave this time ri rising all the way up to that e okay so that's all great but there's very there's very little in the way of support like a, of the of accompaniment like the accompaniment figure is missing here and then also the the um rhythmic patterns get to be very very basic right the um it's just kind of keeping time right and here you've got this roll on timpani and you've got another roll on timpani so i think that maybe it's like in terms of proportion i feel i feel like you know like a timpani roll is like your hundred dollar bill right and if you spend it too many times then you just can't you know you can't spend it anymore right there's you're sort of using up um, you know, you're kind of using up the, the goodwill of the listener. So in, in this case, I would say like, why couldn't the timpani play um, some kind of rhythm that was compatible with the, um, the, the second type of accompaniment figure, you know, ba -ba, ba -ba. you know, couldn't it do that instead of just doing a simple roll and, you know, couldn't some of these instruments, you know, tick, 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 you know, that kind of thing, just like kind of bring out some of that it could you know, could some of the lower winds and brass that aren't doing anything possibly play that, bum, 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 you know, just to give it some life, right? And, you know, do you really want this to be incredibly heavy like this, right? And then the other problem is by ending up on the same pitch with a lot of these instruments going forwards, you are sort of forcing this to start the next phrase, but the phrase actually starts rhythmically on the second beat, right? This is the completion of the previous phrase, ending here. And then the next phrase starts here. Bum, 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 da, 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 right? So these are little groups of three beats starting on the second beat each time, right? And so, so I feel that like, it just needs to be a little bit more calculated about where everybody ends up and then how they go on, right? But I mean, I have to say that the scoring in here is very, very cool, and especially the uh, rhythmic scoring in here is is great. You know, if you could get some orchestral percussionists to pull this off flawlessly, then I think it would sound terrifically exciting. So that just leads to leads forwards to um, maintaining a driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, you know, it all pretty much just writes itself. So, uh, no huge problems in there. I would say if you want to do this kind of trading off, then trade off on the downbeat of the first bar, right? Trade off on the downbeat of the next bar, I mean. So, this could end on a B perfectly possible for your trumpet player that's dovetailing to the trombone and then the trombone could trade off on the F dovetailing to the tuba. Now here you're saying like B flat tuba and I'm just going to flip back for a second. Yeah, so you just say B flat tuba. So I mean, what does that mean? Do you mean like uh, there's a there's a small B flat tuba, which is kind of like the tenor tuba or or euphonium um, there were some smaller French tubas. I think that they were in C or B flat. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you mean. Like you really don't have that many low pitches, right? So maybe that's what you mean. Or you might mean the contrabass tuba in B flat. But I'll tell you something. <clears throat> it's better to let the tuba player make that decision, right? Not you. Just say tuba, right? And then the, the tuba player will look at the part, think about what it what you need to play, you know, if there's some historical aspect to this that needs to be respected, you know, maybe they will, you know, maybe they'll bring their F and their C to a concert. And a lot of times there are players, I think more and more these days, there are players just using their C all the time for everything, you know, playing high parts or low parts and they're perfectly fluid all the way across. But then, you know, there are some people, I, I knew a guy who liked to play in E flat. That was his instrument, his instrument, excuse me, and and you know, he just had beautiful control over it. He could go really, really low. He could get just amazingly low pedal tones on it, 
and he could play fairly high things, but he didn't really like to go above the staff on it, right? He just, it wasn't that he couldn't play those notes. It's just he didn't feel that they had a very good, like they had a very good sound on his instrument or, or it just, he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to strain to get up there. So anyways, um, very, very cool first score for this collection, Lazi. I really, really appreciate it. And I can't wait to look at the next score. So let's just go straight to it. This is such a great score, Christian. I really, really enjoyed it. And the, the interesting thing about it is that it's very, very workable, right? It's, you know, it, it's totally playable. But, like, there are a lot of things you need to fix about it, but they're really easy fixes. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start off with the harp right in here. Okay, so... I think if you've watched a few of these videos already, you will have heard that, in general, when people introduce the harp into a big texture like this, it generally gets buried. Now, having said that, even though you have things marked uh, fortissimo and so on, um, you do also have a, a kind of a lighter touch with your scoring. So it, it's almost workable. It is almost workable. Uh, like right in here, if you were to, um, if you were to reduce the volume of your instruments, then some of this could come through on harp. But at the same time, one pizzicato note in the violas, let's say maybe twelve people, ten to twelve people plucking that string, is going to be much stronger than one harpist plucking their E string. So. I think just in terms of this entire harp part in here, uh, the way to fix it, if you have to fix it, is to have very big, wide, rolling chords. So that, that would come through a lot better in these passages, but still, you know, still would have a tendency to be overwhelmed by things like the, the horns, by the... Um, by the the other winds and so on uh, it just it would be hard for it to cut through but it, it would have some chance right the same thing here and here and then of course right here um, big rolls big rolled chords like before as i mentioned have more of a chance but right in here where pizzicato is very active over the same pitches i think there's very little chance that the harp will be audible no matter what you do so i would say leave it more to the pizzicato strings in that case I love the economy of the parts, the of the of the scoring in here. Um, you know, you do have uh, like a, a three, 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 three. Um, you have triple winds, but you only have two horns, and and I feel it's really effective, right? Um, and then just you know these these more high pitched kinds of sounds, tambourine, triangle, glockenspiel, and so on. So, you know, this this little ting that you're getting out of your harp, you can do the same thing with glockenspiel octaves, right? You could just, um, you know, this will give you the sound that you need there. So you don't need the harp in there. Oops. So now let's talk about the evaluation criteria. There's an overall concern in the list that I shared at the beginning of this video, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano. And you certainly do keep the, you know, it's, it's very much like a transcription. You really do keep, for the most part, the pitch weight in the upper middle register of the orchestra. So really from E in the staff here, D and so on, 
uh, it, it really does stay within the limits. Like here you get down to C below, right? And you can really hear like when the, when your bassoons come in and start playing lower pitches, very audible, right? This really kind of stands out. So that might be a possible concern, right? Like, you know, how, how long can you, can you keep the focus, uh, how, keep the pitch up in that area? Like, you know, how uh, will that start to get tiring to the ear uh, for an entire passage? And, uh, and you know, maybe, maybe not, but then you have to think about the other concern too. And that is that for the most part, the first four bars are scored almost exactly the same as the bars 9 through 12, right? You add a few pitches into the mix here. You've got your violas jo joining in here. You've got these bassoons just adding a little note and so on. So there are a couple little touches, but there's nothing radically different about the first four bars and then the, the repeat later on. Right, so the thing is, like, do you want that to be a carbon copy, or do you want this to somehow build, magnify what happened before? And if that's the case, then breaking the rule or breaking the the boundaries of the original score are completely acceptable, and in fact may be desired. Then the next concern is about melodic development soaring quite high. And the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. So let's talk about the accompaniment first. I feel that you're on the right track with this pizzicato in here and and here, but I feel that it needs more support from other instruments. You know, is is there anything that another instrument could have been doing in here? I mean, you you have everything set up very carefully in certain parts so that it's hard to spread it around, right? You know, you've got but you have second oboe. The second oboe isn't doing anything. Could they be playing? Could they be doubling the for the second violins? Uh, this uh, pizzicato in here. Could that be doubled by say the first, uh, the uh, first bassoon? And then uh, jumping forward to this next part in here, the same thing. You know, the oboes aren't doing anything. Uh, one of those oboes could be doubling this part, and once again, you could have a bassoon uh, doubling the pizzicato. I would say, I would say, in staccato. Don't, don't do these. Like here, you have a pizzicato uh, on a half note value, so uh, which is basically just a, a copy paste error, right? This should, should all just be, you know, this is what you'll get on a viola. You can you can write in the half note all you like, but really the you know the longest very you know the longest audible duration will really be the value of a quarter note at this tempo so i would say if you were to double this part in the in the uh bassoon just have it play quarter note staccato boink 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 right so let's talk about the treatment of the melody right you you have very very uh, very involved very you know, the melody is really stacking up, right? Did you notice that the pizzicato, like these little pizzicato runs in here, are just really not all that strong uh, in in the course of the scoring, right? Pluck, 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 pluck. It just really didn't have very much strength compared to the other instruments. Now, you could have marked these a as accented notes, You've just gotten a little bit stronger of a pluck, and maybe backed off like taking the uh, taking the accents off of these notes off, off of the off of your wind melody, and maybe lightened up the the melody a little bit. You know, do you really need the piccolo on top there? And then and then the pizzicato would come through better. The next question about the melodic treatment is just a slightly disconnected relationship here. I I, I think. You want things to come to sort of an abrupt end and then to have other voices pick up. So you just have to ask how effective that is when the original melody is yet da 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 You know, there's a little bit of of inflection that is missing when you take that approach. However, 
there's nothing really horribly wrong with that. It's, it's just something to think about in terms of just the overall efficacy of the meaning of the line. It's really, really great that you're using E-flat clarinet, uh, flute, piccolo, and oboe together. Those, those have a beautiful uh, complementary resonance, and it's nice the way that you're stacking things up. <clears throat> Here I feel that you're using just enough piccolo, and it's great the way that the piccolo is sort of coming in just enough to dovetail into the flute part and then take it over. I feel that you could do this kind of more efficiently by starting maybe at mezzo piano and then crescendo to fortissimo here, and then you don't feel as if the piccolo is just really starting right on this E. <clears throat> but it, it is a really nice way of continuing the line, and then also, of course, trading off between flute and oboe to... Uh, this ultimately the sound of E flat clarinet and piccolo working together it has a very very um, <clears throat> sort of almost a spiky sort of a, a very crisp kind of sound. People would find it say maybe penetrating or piercing. It might be the way an older orchestration manual might refer to it as. Now here we have a little bit some similar approach as before, but <clears throat> what I feel right in here is that even though the piccolo really sounds delightful here, you sort of use up uh, the the novelty of it, right? So yeah, just you know this lovely piccolo dancing on top, and then it comes back in, and then it, it's almost as if the English horn climbing here, the E flat clarinet dropping. All of these things feel like a very um, <clears throat> a very inelegant splice, right? I think that when you are sort of splicing parts together and you want them one part to carry on to the next one and create the illusion that everybody is going up by the same degree and ultimately ending up on this high E, you have to just be really careful to cover the splice point. So right in here, you could just really hear the uh, the flute and the oboe coming in. It's not an elegant trade-off with the English horn. Uh, just you just really suddenly feel it. So maybe um, maybe the flute should start a little earlier, alongside. You know, there, there could be a splice between the English horn and the oboe, right? But still, even though the, the flute is in a sort of a weaker area here, well, so is so is the uh, piccolo, right? So both of them sort of starting off and heading up this way, then you cover the splice in here. Now, right in here, um, you know what what to do here. What, it there's you know yet another problem in dropping down here. So I would just say just think about this. Maybe there's a way of rethinking this so that the so that going uphill we don't hear the you know we we can't see the scotch tape right that is gluing that is that is pasting these different lines together. That takes us to this next uh, section, and here the the con con the concern in the evaluation criteria is whether or not this feels relentless um, if there is no textural change, uh, and especially if the um, if the weight remains in the upper middle register. And even though you've thrown in a few lower notes here, like the cello's going down to C here and so on, uh, they're really, you know, this is this would could be a place where you could enlarge the scope a little bit, right? So that, like, trading off to here, uh, that is, you know, is a kind of refreshes the, the listener. You had a sort of a bigger area and then you went back to a smaller sound picture. <clears throat> and, you know, going forwards, there just really is a lot of piccolo, right? So, like, I think that just in terms of your own sense of proportion, right, consider whether or not this plus this plus this is too much. What if this were to be dropped down, so it was just doubling with the flute, and then... After you got to this point, you had a little bit more piccolo. So you had that lovely, um, you, you know, the especially as as um, underlined by 
the triangle, that's sort of lovely jingly kind of sound up there. Um, that's just my only concern is, is like how much piccolo can we have? Now here it's perfectly fine, right? That's that's all good. Here, uh, I think it's covering up the pizzicato, the the sort of the the upper frequencies of the pizzicato, making it difficult to hear. Um, so and and then here I feel you're using up the surprise of going all the way up to this high E, right? And per, you know here as well, right? So like the just you know the the sense of the higher like so. So if if we're already going way above E here, then what's the novelty of rushing all the way up to the high E here, right? And then, but if you sort of suppress this, cut that, and then you know after you've gone all the way up to the E, then you've arrived there, and then I think you have more of the listener's goodwill continuing on. But you know, as as far as everything else is concerned, like the scoring in here is is fine. It's 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 very fun. Just be aware, you know, your your in your English horn scoring, this is a um, this is a non-transposed part. But if you were to apply transposition, then you immediately see just really how high uh, some of these parts are. How you know how how far up the English horn is going to have to play. You know up to C there, and, and that's that's perfectly fine for an English horn player. It's not a big deal. It's just it is a different sound, right? Then. Than you would think if you're looking at it and just seeing the English horn player go up to F, right? Which you would normally, in a written F for a English horn player, you would associate with a sort of a richer sound, rather than this more um, strained sound, right? But then here, I just feel that the E flat clarinet part is a lot more readable. Here, I'm just applying some horizontal justification. Yeah, I'd just you know. Something I just prefer is transposed parts whenever I can get them, uh, transposed scores, because like you know it, it makes it just makes more sense if you're used to reading it and understanding what the pitch is. Okay, so anyhow, um, yeah, so this is all fine, and then you have a very simple uh, staccato strings carrying on from there, and you you justify this decision in the in the music that follows you just give me a few bars and that's great because knowing whether or not this passage or this little this little section here uh, will carry on is one of the is also one of the criteria right so um, are you maintaining the uh, the driving staccato right in here yes are you intending to smoothly connect this to a new idea indeed you are and you show me that so Anyway, so I mean, just such a such a fun score. Um, really, really enjoyed this one, Christian. Um, I, I think you have a lot of like really, you know, bright colors and a light touch with the scoring, and yet very, very effective. And you know, just the use of the horns, very judicious, and just adding enough color and weight and so on. Um, yeah. But as I said before, I feel like the like the accompaniment figures need to be a little stronger. Perhaps some doubling from winds. Perhaps uh, spread out a little bit more across the sound picture and so on. Uh, don't take the harp's strength for granted. You know, some of this is almost possible with maybe a big roll and and more pitches. Um, but you know, right in here with the horns going and and so on there there really isn't a whole lot of chance for the harp to be audible right in here and and indeed with the uh, these pitches uh doubling what's going on in the harp it you know maybe you'll hear these high b's maybe or maybe not because of all of the other stuff happening so so anything that you know any any time you would really want to bring the harp in as an effective uh part of the sound picture you really have to have a you have to have space have to have um, dynamic uh, space right in there, and and you know you have to score instruments that don't absorb the sound of the harp so much, like horn. It really absorbs the sound of the harp, especially in a situation like this where you know you're playing, they're playing very similar pitches, right? You've um, or the same pitches. You've got the um, this same sounding F fifth, right, and then this exact same pitches right here, this F fifth. Well, the horn is just going to absorb this entirely, and its overtones are going to absorb this, right? So, anyway, so just things to think about. But I mean, really, just a great approach, and you know, you show a bit of experience here, and 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 some foresight in a lot of 
your approach. It seems as if you have have done something similar to this before, and so you know, pretty much, you know, I I have yet to run into one person who I wouldn't want to see join the next uh, challenge, and you know, and yet I know just like. What, how many entries are we going to get there? 200. I don't know how many I can actually functionally do without, you know, going crazy. <laughs> actually, I really enjoy it a lot, but you know, it is sort of, you know, it's the, it's, after a while, it's kind of the same thing, right? And, and I need to change what I do and keep things fresh too. So anyway, but I, I would be really interested to, to see how you tackled the next challenge, which I think will actually be the most difficult. This one I felt was the most difficult so far, but I think the next one, as simple as you will think that it sounds, to actually orchestrate effectively will be a, a huge challenge. And I would love to see you apply yourself to that. So with that, I will thank you for your entry and move on to the next one. Well, this score is a lot of fun. <laughs> I really love the wild variety between parts and and all the very daring dynamics, and uh, it, it's just so much fun. So, I think the the best way to help you with this is just to get straight to the the concern uh, about audibility of celesta and harp and so on. Okay, so. <laughs> You have set up some beautifully cresting dynamics and changing dynamics, pianissimo subito, all these other things. Okay, you are running into some problems. The that the um, your mock-up is not telling you about. If you have this much force at fortissimo, that is going to stop right at this bar line and continue on to just the first beat. The reverb of the hall is going to wash over, especially with trumpets and, you know, and, and horns ending right there. And these upper strings and winds doubling each other. That is going to set up this big wash of reverb that lasts, that lasts until about right here in the hall. So, so this nice little harp and celesta uh, solo right in here is not going to be all that audible. So if you really want this to come out, like to be very beautifully uh, audible from the very beginning, then you have got to tame the rest of the orchestra and just bring everything down to, I would say, bring it all down to pianissimo by, the, this, by this beat. You know, maybe just even just the last two beats, a sudden diminuendo to pianissimo and diminuendo in all the other parts that don't, don't have a downbeat. And you, you know, even just write the pianissimo at the end of the bar, just to be absolutely sure that everybody comes down in volume. And this can be pianissimo subito, but do not mark your celesta and harp pianissimo subito, because they are at a huge disadvantage to everything else happening. They should be marked forte, right? So forte, celesta, and harp, pianissimo subito, first bassoon, right? And... Same thing here. Uh, this note right here is will be completely inaudible, so you might as well not even give it to the harp player. But you know, what is, who's going to hear this, right? If you are, if the same note is being played fortissimo by both your first violins and your first flute, and there's going to be this big raucous sounding B underneath it from your trumpets and so on, and the and the. Um, and some of these other in brass instruments are going to be cranking it out and so on. So, you know, and, and xylophone, right? So there's just, I mean, why is this note even here, right? So they just bring everything to an end. The, the sense of the kind of uh, plink 
of this note will be expressed by the xylophone. There's no need for the harp to be involved here, right? All right, um, but that just brings up like, you know, what is working in the harp and celesta and what isn't? Well, right in here, the harp and celesta are invisible. Right? You can hear it in the mock-up. You can, um, I, I can just hear it in my inner ear that um, fortissimo strings and doubled by these winds very, very actively in the, and then even like throwing in the harmony and the very vigorous uh, accompaniment pattern uh, which I really admire, by the way. I think it's a really nice um, uh, transcription of it. That is powerful enough. The chalessa and the harp are adding nothing here, right? They, they they cannot be heard. They are invisible. Now, it's almost also just about in, invisible to hear this. Like, I, I see you have this scored at fortissimo. Perhaps you couldn't hear it in the... Um, in the... Uh, in the mock-up, but you know, you know what would would sound would give you this sound here was the glockenspiel, since this is uh, all white keys, right? All uh, all large tone bars, all, all the tone bars in the front, right? So you can do that same glissando on glockenspiel, and it'll come through m much much better than it would on celesta. So I would just say just leave the celesta out until right here, not pianissimo subito, but forte in both parts. As to the glissandos on the harp, obviously you can hear them in the mock-up and I can hear them in my mind and just judging, looking at this orchestra, that, that those will all work fine. Okay, now right in here, once again, this will work, but, uh, you know, at forte, right? So, so celesta and harp part marked to forte and I'm not so convinced by forte piano here. Uh, you, you know, you um, but the melody doesn't go bum 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 bum, does it? It just goes dun 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 dun, and then dun 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 dun. Right? There's there's it's it's not it's not dun 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 dun. It's dun 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 bum 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 dun 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 dun. Right? So it's two separate. It is two separate ideas thematically. So, you know, it's kind of forcing it into this. Yet, yeah, dun, dun. I mean, you can throw it in here and there, but if you throw it in here, the beginning of this bar in the brass and the forte piano in all the other parts, it will just kill the first bar of celesta and harp. If you want this celesta and harp to be effective, just get rid of that forte piano, get rid of the brass. Right? There's, there's just no need for that forte piano there. I see, I see you want to go, yeah, da, 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 right? So what if, what if there just wasn't a crescendo here? Uh, you know, what if you just went, um, instead, what if you went diminuendo here, right? Yeah, da, 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 I mean, I, I see what you're trying to get with in this, this, in this effect, but it really is just spoiling the entrance of your, of your harp and celesta here. But I mean. I'm just telling you how to make it work effectively. Now here you're saying non arpeggiando. Okay, so non arpeggiando is the way to disguise the harp rather than to make it more useful. Granted, you don't have the strongest of textures here for the harp to play against. You just have first and second violins and the first flute on top. But all the same, a big roll is very audible on harp. Just playing the pitches non arpeggiando, and then of course like continuing to get softer every time, the harp will really be barely audible here. Even even though you're just playing against some violins here, I just I just feel that rolling is a better way when there when the when the dynamics are loud, right? Now here you got more of a chance, but and then of course this is all very audible. But did you notice? that this really isn't all that audible. It's really more of a thing for the glockenspiel if you want this to come through really nicely. Glockenspiel is, is a bit louder than Celesta and certainly has a has a timbre. Um, just the way that the the difference in the way that the tone bars are constructed uh, and the and the you know way the way the instrument is just sitting there projecting its its um, 
right off of the tone bars into you know into the air with a with a little resonator underneath it. That is a much stronger sound on the Glockenspiel than it is on Celesta. So <laughs> now let's apply the evaluation criteria. So overall, the concern about uh, things being stuck in the upper middle register of the orchestra as it is in the piano score is not a big concern. The concern about the first two bars being repeated several times is not a concern you know, in terms of just the same exact orchestration because you're taking a different approach every two bars and that's great. Okay, except like right in here, it's just a big boisterous four bars of, of fun. So that, you know, just looking at the orchestration of everything in here, uh, I, I don't see anything that is all that, uh, all that difficult. I love the little trill here on top. Uh, about the only thing that I would say is that this B down here on the second flute is just really not all that strong, right? Um, it, it'll, it, it'll sort of help to add a little bit of timbre to the second oboe, but really the second oboe will be so much more powerful in this register than the second flute. You might as well just have scored this to be A2 on the top note, right? Now here, giving this part to the second doesn't really make any sense. That sh this should be the first flute player. Trust, you know, trust your first flute player. That is their job. The job of the second player is to support the first, right? And, and it's great to give the second something to do. This is fine right in here. But, but don't just assume that you need to spread around the duties between first and second. You know, always give the second something to do because otherwise they get bored. You know, um, if it's a sort of a support part, like right in here, that's fine. Like, but that's like the second's job is to to play support parts, right? Um, anything that has to do with a solo, sort of being exposed or or having to do some kind of blending with three other instruments or two other instruments. Three other instruments, xylophone, first clarinet, and first oboe. Then really it should be the first player who's playing this. But I, I would actually say A2 would work all the way through on the top line here. And then this, if you want to double this low B, then the that's the job of the second clarinet, right? Okay. Okay, so then you know just going on this all works great i like the strings and the yeah this push here the triangle trill well it'll sound a little bit like a phone ringing but that's all right you've got these other elements the glissando and everything else that will help to moderate it and then the big push right into this and then you have really a strong accompaniment strategy so we're getting into the next group of uh, of criteria concerns, right? That it's the um, the soaring melody and the accompaniment styles, like how how well can you interpret those? And and I, I like your neat solution, which is to sort of spread them across uh, the different ranges. I mean, you're really going low there into the contrabassoon area and the double bass area, but it's still, it works really nicely. And yeah, I, I feel that that you know the triple octave double bass plus contra bassoon cello plus bassoons and uh, clarinets plus horns is is a really nice stack and that you know if you really you know if you must do this double octave here with the violas supporting the violins that's fine right and and then you know you you really like you're throwing in the piccolo right at the end to pick up on this. I would say if you want the piccolo to be more um, more of a of just sort of insinuating itself into the music, don't start on a fortissimo. Start on like mezzo forte crescendo to fortissimo at, by the time you get here. And then it'll just feel as if the piccolo part came out of the first flute part and then arced over the top. Piccolo can be pretty strong right up in this area, um, especially like on a cold start, right? Just just suddenly, boom, right there in the line. You can suddenly feel it, right? 
But, I mean, you know, I mean, that doesn't seem to be a big concern with the way you're taking this approach. You're trading off between xylophone and glockenspiel and so on. And, yeah, I mean, that's all good. Yeah. It's a little strange here. You're going... You're playing this high C, which is the highest C of the piano, because Glockenspiel has um, is a. Um, it's basically a two octave, uh, trans, uh, uh, fifteen ma, uh, quindicissima, uh, transposition. So you're throwing in this C here as a just sort of you know it's just so high it doesn't really make any sense to the ear. Uh, and it's on top of the piccolo, so it's more or less the piccolo's overtones. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's fine. Or you could just score everything um, alongside the piccolo, like uh, doubling the piccolo. Anyway, it's all good. Okay, and then then this works in here if if you bring up the dynamics, right? And then and then just you know this is great. So see how you're going. Jump, bum, bum, bum. And then bum, 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 bum. maybe going jump, jump twice in a row, right? What if you just cut this entirely? Jump, bum, 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 da, 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 da. And then, and then, right? And just right in here, not piano marcato, just piano, right? Don't don't make things overstressed. Cut all the accents, and give some nice nuances here to the celesta and the harp just you know increasing like playing into this uh, in the in its accompaniment All right and then push again right so i think just that you have so many pushes in a row uh that this is just problematic uh, just to just in terms of making this audible in the first place if not the fact that it is kind of the same strategy over and over right Okay, and then we get to this, uh, and I really love the phrasing in here. Bum, bum, bum. Just like taking these uh, uh, middle winds and uh, and horn and so on. So, yeah, it's going to be very, very bright, this written G sounding C, right? And it, you know, sitting right in the middle uh, of this sound picture in here, the, you know, it kind of basically um, kind of pushing at the same note here uh that is written d um yeah it's right so g f sharp yeah hmm okay all right it's all good yeah i just I think you're missing an F natural here. But anyways, not to get in, I, I try not to correct little harmony errors or stuff because it just sort of wastes everybody's time. But just be aware that, that this is really going to, like the the um, the pressure, right, that is needed to play this is, is going to be very intense and it will really take over the inside of this wind scoring in here. But I mean, otherwise, you know, if you did... I think if you did mezzo piano crescendo to forte and then backed off down to mezzo piano again or mezzo forte and uh, I don't know you know maybe maybe this these three notes could be played by trumpet instead just so that could, where there's you know the player has way more control and it isn't just such a just a note of huge pressure all right and then I just love the way you're throwing things around here you know yep up up beep do 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 blah 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 blah, and that's that's really nice. Uh, I would say there's a big risk here in giving the celesta the melody note here. I would give it to um, Glockenspiel, seriously, because uh, the you, you know will anybody hear this? It, it isn't really a passage that is set up to highlight the celesta as a solo um, instrument, and it's and it's a series of sudden diminuendos right and then just suddenly the celeste is supposed to be the soloist right and i just don't think that i think that this is these are four notes that could go by so fast and in the rush 
um, could just really be easily ignored. Whereas if they were in glockenspiel, they'd be beautifully audible. And then all of this fun stuff in here. Um, yeah, and, and as I said before, once again, much more effective on glockenspiel in terms of audibility. And that kind of really silvery quality, which here will easily get um, covered by all of the instruments, especially the more that come in and the hotter that they come in, right? Now, right in here, there's a sort of a, a driving staccato or driving marcato quality, which isn't really kind of borne out by the, you, you know, it's, you have these accents on the, like the second note of each pair of, of eighths and so on, you know, da 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 da, -da. Okay, and that's, that's all, all great, but I, I don't think, I think in, like ultimately, it may be less effective than just having just straight staccatos on everything. And then like you are heading to a final chord, like a big final chord, but the criteria um, about this passage are, you know, not just the driving staccato, but also, uh, you know, what is it leading to? Is this a smooth connection to the next passage? And I can't really say that because I don't know how you would you know, how you would realize this going forward. You probably would change things if you were going to orchestrate from B onwards, I'm guessing. But, I mean, it's still nicely done. There really, you know, isn't anything in here that I would consider to be hugely problematic, right? Or, I mean, I think you've got some great ideas, like then the colors are just wonderful. So, um, you know, I'm not really counseling you to change a whole lot of things besides, like, you know, watch out for putting... Yeah, putting the um, the horn right in the middle of this wind harmony uh, on such a high note, things like that. You know, like little touches, um, bringing down the volume, maybe changing this and so on. But I'm not real. But like the overall effect of of the scoring here is really nicely done. I just uh, really enjoy it a lot. And little touches of xylophone are fun. What's funny is like how different this part sounds than this part here, even though they both have this xylophone solo in the middle of them. You know, they, they're, they're just the context is so different that it feels completely fresh when you bring xylophone back in. Such a fun score. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of mostly what I have to say about it. There are a few other things that I'm sure other people will catch um, that I kind of didn't have time to go into, but it's really solid work and, and very imaginative and colorful and, and so on. So, so and an excellent, uh, uh, an excellent entry to the challenge and also a really, really great part of this particular collection. Now let's see what's next in our little treasure chest of orchestrations. Right. <laughs> really, really cool, Leonardo. So I think like I just to extend the conversation about Celesta and Harp, it's really cool the way that you have this scored. Uh, I, I like it a lot. Um, but you can you can just tell by the mock up that the Celesta isn't really quite balanced. And uh, the harp is pretty much non existent in, in these single pitches. Right, and this chord, this is really, this is this has got a chance right in here of being played against the the clarinets, but it's all a matter of balancing things out. The easiest way out of your predicament here is just to score the top line of Celesta for the glockenspiel and get rid of the Celesta part because there's nothing really in the Celesta part. It's it's. It uh, that you know that necessarily uh, needs the piano type of approach, right? The sort of pianistic kind of approach. It really, it's just the single lines, but you are bringing out these single lines as 
you know, as a sort of two-handed keyboard kind of interpretation. So it could just as easily be played by a glockenspiel and get you that beautiful chiming effect. The the lower pitches, you probably noticed, the, just even, even when the celesta was at its most audible, it was almost impossible to hear the lower pitches anyway, right? And especially if you've got piccolo and flute working from below. Uh, so I, I think that this could all be just transferred to to glockenspiel and it would come out fine. But just to you know to take seriously what you're doing here in your scoring, the thing to remember about Celeste is that it is a mezzo piano instrument at its loudest, right? So you can have the player hammering away at the keys and it doesn't really make the hammers uh, that actually hit the little bells inside the Celesta, you know, that hitting them harder doesn't necessarily result in a bigger sound or a, or more projection, right? It, it just kind of changes the context of the attack a bit. Uh, and, and so, like, within its own scope, like, within the scope of... Also, the, the Celesta cannot play down to a whisper. That's the other problem, right? Even As soft as it is. So... The pianissimo on a celesta is sort of like piano for the orchestra. And uh, fortissimo is kind of like mezzo piano, right? So it has a kind of a limited uh, scope. Now, in the best, you know, like with uh, with a really good player and, and, you know, the best kind of circumstances, you could probably broaden that to an orchestral pianissimo and mezzo forte, right? But... I would say just think of the celesta as more or less being a mezzo piano dynamic instrument um, at, at its loudest. And that doesn't really leave you a whole lot of options when you have these big textures, right? Now here you are dropping down your your winds and strings, uh, mezzo piano, then you have these little mezzo forte pow right in there, right? But see, a little bit at a disadvantage by throwing in the xylophone there because the xylophone kind of interferes with our ability to hear the clarity of the of the Celesta's tone and also the you know of course the harp just sort of disappears into the xylophone because the xylophone will just absorb that timbre and against the continuing fortissimo of the flute and piccolo it doesn't really have much of a chance either so if you were to drop everybody down to piano and keep the Celesta at fortissimo then you've got a chance here but I'm not so sure that that is really you know, that really works in your overall dynamic scheme and the colors that you want to get out of things, right? And, and you know similar problems in here. So maybe just Glockenspiel is the way to go there. All right. As to the harp, there just isn't a chance. Even even though you're really dropping down the volume, there, there's just such an involved uh, scheme going on here in terms of the timbre that these plucked notes are just really not going to come through. Uh, the harp just really needs a lot of elbow room. Now, the, these uh, glissandos are going to be great. But here you work against yourself by saying non arpeggiando. Because <coughs> the problem is that mezzo forte, like a, a sort of a mezzo forte tutti, tutti in this case, um, is still louder than the harp. And you know, bringing it, you're bringing in horns, and you've got a forte melody happening here in a two trumpets, right? So just this alone is enough to obscure what's going on on the harp, unless there is a big roll. And by a big roll, I mean hand over hand, covering a lot of distance. Just you know, uh, starting lower lower in the bass staff with the left hand, and then continuing on to the right hand, and then the left hand comes over the top. Right hand over hand is what I mean. So left, right, left, going to the top. Uh, in a with a big gushing roll. Now that will come through in this big texture, but you can hear in the mock-up, right? I mean, not that I want people to trust mock-ups, but generally in terms of heart balance, the the note performer mock-up is proving to be fairly reliable in showing limitations, right? And then of course you have to mark this fortissimo crescendo, right? because see where you're going with everybody else. And then here, I would say, keep it fortissimo, marcato, mark each 
uh, each note with a um, with a tenuto mark. That's that'll that'll you know get a very kind of a very uh, pressured kind of plucking from the harpist. That you know that really helps the tone to project. And here, fortissimo clarinets against harp. The clarinets will pretty much win. So I would say it would be better to just have the clarinet players go maybe forte piano crescendo right there's a crescendo in the in the part so forte piano crescendo to maybe mezzo forte here and then back out right and then your harp could be forte or fortissimo or i'd say forte with um uh forte with the um tenuto articulation all right so that is how I would fix those problems that are being presented. But like looking at the other scoring, <laughs> there's so much good to say about it. So let's start off with our evaluation criteria. Um, we have the first one, which is uh, being careful about not keeping things as limited as the piano score in terms of pitch range. That's not a problem. You expand things out really nicely here. Then we have the next problem, possibly, which is employing the same uh, orchestration approach twice. You don't do that. You keep things varied. This, uh, these two passages here are more similar, but even in this case, bringing in trumpets and so on, it just really brings in a different flavor. So Now here, um, you're using the harp as part of the rhythmic element of the uh, of the accompaniment figure and i feel having this much activity this much engagement now here you have this double octave a two trumpets below and then both sets of violins plus flute plus piccolo on top it's going to be a very directed sound just very aggressive and i feel that the accompaniment strategy that you have here just really doesn't, there's almost not enough, you know what I mean? Uh, if things were a lot softer, I would say bring in the harp and just have the harp take over some of this, or if there were a chance to double some of this, um, some of this tremolo with also with maybe pizzicato as well, or if there was a chance for the maybe to use one of the clarinets and bass clarinet together and and help to flush out some of the pattern, I think that would be great. Now, see in here, like you're you're using the xylophone to kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the accompaniment part, and and it it really has a lot of energy and really cuts through. But is it enough all on its own just to to take care of that job, right? So it's just something you have to ask yourself. Here, I probably would make things a little bit fuller. That's just kind of my particular uh, preference. But I mean, it does really work. I mean, you have this sort of feverish feeling in here. I, I love the, the idea of the tremolo instruments right in here. Here, um, just make sure that when you have a flag or a beam that you have one less uh, tremolo beam, right? Because the flag is already a beam. So triple beam on a single stem with no with no um, with no connection to another note. Say like you know this isn't an eighth note; it's just a quarter note. But here you have an eighth note which has its flag. So you would get rid of one of these beams in your tremolo. Yeah, and it just would mean just means the same rate of tremolo all the way through. Then okay. So, you know, despite those reservations, I, I think it's kind of nicely done. Um, I almost wonder, you know, the kind of the fervency of it. Uh, you know, there could be some sort of kind of inflection right in inside these bars. Just, you know, it's the sort of the passion underneath the surface. All right, and then you just sort of head for the hills here. <laughs> English horn dovetailing into oboes. And then the flutes sort of cutting out and clarinet in a straight line. Uh, yeah, and then you're sort of coming in. So I would say use caution about new instruments coming in and instruments dropping their line at the same exact time, right? Because you just, 
really it just really feels disconnected right you you you're running towards the top and then suddenly everybody drops the entire upper wind or upper string section drops down a seventh and second clarinet comes in right in here and you change over and the flutes drop out it all it all happens at once right so the result is that the um it's like we're it, it's like looking at a wall that has been painted and you can see where the seam in the in the sheetrock or jib uh, to use the commonwealth term you can see the where the wallboard has a seam right so that's that's what i'm feeling here it's both sides of this you know either side of this bar line are, are beautifully scored but i can just really hear where the join is in the architecture is it possible that some instruments could, like you could stagger where the drop is? Some instruments could go on a little bit further. Uh, some instruments could could go on a little bit and then drop and then continue on. Uh, some instruments could come in a little earlier. There's no reason why the second clarinet couldn't come in right here, right? So uh, maybe maybe rethink that that seam right here, right? That it, it just feels sewn together. A little bit and then of course crescendo to forte in your trumpets in the sudden absence of them will be really audible right here comes the horn the trumpets they're just really rushing up and then they're gone and then everybody else comes in and there's this big drop and everything all happening at once so once again that this gap right in here will be very audible so just just think maybe rethink that a little bit Okay, and I like the differentiation here between the end of the phrase and the beginning of the next one. Yeah, and this is really nicely done. Yeah, and yeah, the the I like the brass right in here. I think that's really cool. And then, of course, I've already talked about this. I think this is really, really nice. Um, the sense of relentlessness is not an issue because of the the change of the sort of textural context, and then of course right in here the um, the sort of driving staccato and the sense of leading to something. Um, I could I could really imagine this leading to something that is more harp dominated and and lightly scored. Right, you're really setting it up, and you could even put a crescendo in here and back off and maybe. Um, you know, really apply some different uh, some different ideas than just a trans straight transcription of the uh, of the material. There's just so many different ways to interpret Faya's score, and that's one of the wonderful things about it. Um, the first time I heard it, I was actually thinking, oh, you know, where's the, you know, where is the 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 structure to this piece? Um, you know what? it just seems to be composed of like four or five different sections and they're all very different from each other. And, you know, the more I listened to it, the more I, I got that and started to absorb the actually beautifully conceived structure. But I was also impressed by going phrase to phrase, how much um, opportunity he was presenting to an arranger to really come up with their own ideas and their own, um, you know their own unique ways of interpreting the material and i'm seeing that in buckets you know i just every score is so individual that i'm getting from people and i feel that the the next year's um next year's challenge is going to also sort of drive people to that although there's more homogeneity throughout the score and the the sense of structure is is really kind of obvious uh on the face of it but it, you know, it's still like to, in order to interpret it, <laughs> is going to be a really huge challenge, and I'm I'm just curious to see how everybody will come up, you know, what what kinds of ideas everybody will come up with. So uh, with that, I will say thank you so much, Leonardo, for such a diverting score and you know, it's just just bubbling with good ideas, and you know, really really deserves its place alongside the other scores that we've seen so far. Um, so let's continue the trend in our next entry.
as I mentioned in the end of the previous entry, uh, you know, we are just having a bit of a marathon here of beautifully varied ideas and, and different approaches. And while this one is more solidly cohesive all the way through, it really just has its own sound and is very different. So, so we'll be talking about a lot of different things. Uh, let me just fix your score a little bit here, okay, Johan? Um, all right, and this can go. All right, so that looks better. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about marimba and harp before we dive into this. Now, Johan, you may have been following some of the uh, some of the discussion, <laughs> some of my other evaluations, and you might be dreading what I'm going to say about <laughs> about the harp and marimba here. But it is really true that certain parts in here are are really kind of inaudible. Now, there are alternatives. Just easy, like this kind of thing right in here, would sound terrific on xylophone, right? But, I mean, it's really not the same sound, is it? It's just a really bright, a percussive sound, and it doesn't have that same body that marimba has. But along with the body that you get with marimba, you also get a different structure of overtones, which, you know, when you apply those overtones to the kind of wooden attack of the instrument, you know, the, the kind of the wood on wood sort of sound of the mallet hitting the tone bar. When you have the, the, the harmonic overtone structure of say like a, you know, the, uh, just this kind of the standard overtones that you get from like a violin or a, an oboe or something like that, brass instrument, then they get absorbed really, really easily into the sound picture. Whereas a xylophone has the same overtone structure as a clarinet, <laughs> right? And so you, it has all of these odd numbered partials and they're very, very easy to hear. But that also gives the xylophone its uh, very intrusive character as well. So, I mean, I just, I, I don't feel this will be very audible. And the harp, of course, is even at a worse disadvantage trying to play against fortissimo brass and, you know, big tuba notes and so on. So both of these instruments are a bit wasted in the overall scheme, and, and that's a real shame. Um, like, the, there, there's got to be some way of giving you that, that kind of sort of punchy, plucky kind of a sound. And I mean, aside from going to pizzicato with the strings and xylophone, I can't really think of any any convenient, obvious way. But maybe a few people will comment below. Maybe things are are punchy enough just having the heavy brass coming in like this. Uh, then right in here, see, like you have this opportunity. If everybody just quieted the hell down, then you could hear the marimba and the harp which work together beautifully, by the way, right? So just really back off on, you know, the cymbals absorb that sound, just cool the cymbals down. Uh, and then you can just have your bia da 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 with pluka pluka pluk, pluka pluka pluk, right? So, but if you can't do that, right? If you are absolutely determined, this is a little strange, forte, forte crescendo to forte. I don't understand that. But if you are really determined to have this be your accompaniment strategy, then you absolutely have to bring down the volume to very, very soft. Mezzo piano, right? If not softer. And of course, keep this at forte. Now, uh, staccato on a harp, right, has, is a specific kind of a very dry plucking, right? It just involves cutting off the notes really quickly. I don't think that's what you mean here. So you should get rid of the staccato. You, you want a generous sound here. And the same thing is true with marimba. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a stroke that is very, very dry. And, you know, if you're going to go for dry strokes, you might as well just just score xylophone there and, and solve both problems, right? But once again, I think you want the more gener generous kind of... Um, that, that, um, that very... I, I want to say sort of... Like, I'm thinking of, a, of, a, of like a watermelon... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like when I th when I think about the the tone of a marimba, you know, just like the and it's just the shape of the of the um, it's it's the wave shape. It looks a little bit like a watermelon to me, mentally. So yeah, so um, yeah, you, you would just really have to bring this down. So and if you cannot bring the volume down in your conception, then you have to rethink your accompaniment strategy. If you wanted that sort of plucking percussive kind of a sound, you you know you might need to go to xylophone uh, for your mallet instrument and pizzicato for your uh, strings, and that's how you would be able to maintain that. Okay, so I, I'm starting to get into the province of the uh, of the evaluation criteria, but I'll try to sort of limit that. Um, now here, see, like you're bringing this down to piano. If everybody brought came down to piano, then the the chile, the excuse me the marimba. I keep wanting to say chalesta. The marimba and the harp would have a chance here. Here, big rolled chords, right, would come through really nicely. If everybody were playing softer, like mezzo forte then your marimba has a chance in here at forte. Of course. Uh, one, of, one of the big problems uh, with contemporary composers working with marimba players is just asking the marimba player to use harder and harder mallets, right? It's almost as if they're trying to turn the marimba into some kind of xylophone. And using a very hard mallet on a marimba bar can just break it right in half. Um, if, you know, if it's hit at the... I mean, and even when the player doesn't intend to do that, the bars cracking are always a risk because some of those bars are milled fairly thin. Uh, so, yeah, so you just, you know, just having the marimba player just pound away at their marimba because you are not balancing the rest of the orchestra is probably not the, you know, not the most opportune thing. And then a passage like this with so much weight, it's just very hard for the marimba or the harp to come through. But as I said before, you know, bringing down the volume, if you had big rolls in your harp and you know your marimba player might be able but it just you know it's really almost feeling more like a like a xylophone line all the way through you know the more i sort of think about it and think about the balance that you're asking okay so let's get past all that all right and talk about the specific evaluation criteria now there's absolutely no problem with any kind of limitation in direct transcription of the pitch range being stuck in the upper middle register, you are not doing that. There is, however, a bit of a concern, right? If this concern resonates with you, if, the, if it doesn't, then it's not a problem. But if the concern resonates with you of repeating yourself, right? Almost note for note. And, and that is kind of what you do here, like this. Um, you have this push and then ending here, but like the, aside from this, these notes sort of going pow right in here. Uh, these two pairs of bars are essentially identical. And then they are more or less identical here, except for like the downbeat. So it's just a question of like, you know, how much do you want to do that in your scoring? You know, do you want to give yourself an opportunity to build towards something enormous here, right? So what if you were to start with a smaller scope in both of these parts and then get bigger and then get to fortissimo here right so um there're just a, there are a bunch of different ways of doing it but but i would say that that just you know watch out for that now um if if we take away our reliance on on these instruments it it kind of it takes a little takes away a little bit of the of sort of the the timbre right in here right it's it, you know, I mean, removing them, right, affects the timbre, even though leaving them in doesn't really uh, contribute very much to the sound picture, in, you know, in terms of the presence of the instruments, right? So I would say if you can figure out alternate things to do, which I've already suggested in there, I think you can preserve the, the punch that you are intending right in here. All right, and then bum, 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 bum. I like the, the motion, the, making this into kind of like a chordal motion. That's very cool. All right, and now, uh, 
going on to our next concerns, which are the accompaniment figure. I've already discussed that. Uh, now here you, you you sort of you just sort of drop that ba 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 da 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 kind of feeling um, that is in the left hand, and you just go bonk 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 bonk. I'm not sure that that's enough. Um, I, I think you might need a you know to to sort of portray the nimbleness, right? This is very kind of heavy handed. It's very it's just very just just punching down on you know one two one two. We're not getting we're not getting that kind of leaping sound, that kind of very dancing pseudo flamenco kind of a sound. And then of course, like these instruments are not strong enough to carry things the way that the dynamics are scored. Or if you have to hold on to the dynamics, you need to change the instruments. Okay, um, but in terms of the melodic interpretation, okay, so. So that's fine, going all the way up to this high D. It's a little shrieky, though, right? And here you go all the way up to E. So just, you know, it's playable. It's just not the most beautiful sound in the world. Um, and here, like, you're giving that, you're giving those pitches, pitches to the piccolo. So so maybe the, what if the, what if the violins didn't actually have to go that high and you made the, um, you made the piccolo do most of the work of sort of realizing the expectations, right? But one thing that sort of puzzles me here is the dropout, right? We've got we've got the oboes playing an octave below, right? Okay, so they're playing an octave below the violins, and then suddenly, no more oboes. And we've got the kind of double octave of winds, or excuse me, of uh, flutes and piccolo, sort of jumping into this. And then here, we have that gap there. So I'm not sure if these gaps translate all that well. I mean, like, uh, having a fortissimo crescendo and then just sudden dead dead space, right? The, the audience will feel that gap, right? That it just, it'll really be almost glaring. And the same thing here, oboe, crescendo, nothing, right? So... Does this possibly need a little bit of a rethink? Could you do something like this, possibly? Here, I'm going to delete the Atava. By the way, your um, your violin players do not need the Atava. What if you did something like this, right? So the D and the C, the overtones from this D and C, uh, plus the ones from the, the same notes from the first flute would be enough to fill in the blanks for the listener, right? So they would feel this all as one big arc, even though you drop down just for a couple of notes. Anyway, whatever you do, this is sufficient. Any decent first violinist should be able to read this. You don't need that octava in there. Okay, um, now looking at the treatment of the melody going on, uh, this shares some problems uh, with some other scores that you may have seen up to up to this point in this video and that is everybody dropping at the same time so that drop is going to be heard by everybody it doesn't matter how many other people are on that if you have I would say three key instruments and especially one so high you know there's the piccolo uh, just suddenly dropping down and then rushing up again I feel like this entire episode here on Piccolo, right here and also here, it sort of steals the, it steals away the, um, the novelty of rushing all the way up to this high E, right? So if we've already heard high E and 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 higher in the Piccolo here and there, then then. What's so exciting about running up to it here? Is you're just fulfilling a, a function in the music and not really um, realizing the, um, the the emotional impetus, right? And you know, as far as that's concerned, why can't the piccolo just really hold off on playing very very high pitches? Maybe all of this could be down an octave, so we don't really hear anything high from the piccolo until here. Yeah, bum, 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 bum. And the same thing here, drop these two an octave, drop this an octave, 
and then you have this nice line going all the way up here. And do not worry about the fact that the B will be sort of low in its weaker area. That will all come out in the wash, as they say, as you run up to here. But then, even at that, still having the first flute and the uh, clarinet. I'm not sure if this is A2. I guess it's one clarinet, right? You've got clarinets one and two. All right. Um, having them both drop at the same time, it will st we'll, we will hear that drop, right? So I would say maybe have the, uh, the first clarinet drop earlier, and then maybe the, the first flute can get all the way up to F and then drop. And then it will fold into the sound picture better. And once again, you know, anybody who is capable of playing this score is capable of reading this, all right? And, and once again, and that, like, taking away the ottava, so this could be another tip. <laughs> I should write this down. Taking away the ottava reveals the, the, the consequences, right? They, you know, you really are sending up the violins into a very shrieky place. You are sending the flutes up to a place where they can't play, right? The, the standard flute wouldn't be able to go past the D, right? And then just throwing this sky-high E in there really brings home you know the the fact that it is that it is starting to get to be out of range so yeah so i'm making a mental note <laughs> to include that as one last word about atava okay so um this push is great um, this is kind of interesting that you sort of back off in your lower winds and horns and lower brass. That's kind of neat. And then pow. But yeah, and you and this sort of gives the illusion that there are that all these instruments are playing on the downbeat here. It, they are just moved over because of the uh, the tight vertical space. Now, I really love the way that you end this phrase on the downbeat and then you begin the next one on the second beat, which is really the way it should be, you know, two, three, one, two and three and one, two and three and one. Okay, so uh, beautiful idea to have a variation between this and this, but doesn't that beg the question that maybe there could be variation between this and that? What if you went brass wins with a little help from strings? Strings, right? I mean, what if there was some way of kind of like trading things off and then you just eventually ended up in this kind of all of this sort of playing right in here. I think I think it's a little weird to have uh, the um, the clarinets come out and and then diminuendo into like the saxophone and so on. So this is something that I haven't mentioned yet and that's the alto saxophone part, the baritone saxophone part. I feel that this is you know you're you're sort of folding the saxophone right into the score in a, in a just really convenient ways that work alongside other instruments really, really well. So there's kind of nothing about the scoring that is that is wrong or bad or anything like that. But one thing that I will say about the alto saxophone right in here is that if you are pushing forward like this towards fortissimo and then you suddenly drop out to nothing, that sudden drop will be really audible similar to some other dropouts, you know, that I've mentioned right in here, but, but I would say even more intense, right? And, and, and bringing in the bassoons here to sort of double and, and it doesn't, that will still won't cover it because the alto saxophone will be so strong. It'll be so thick down in that lower register. This is, this is a score where I probably should have hit the transpose button and then it's just a little clearer, right? So you can see that the Alto saxophone isn't getting below its written B. Yeah, see, like this just all of a sudden, I know what pitches I'm looking at. It's funny how a C score to somebody who's used to just reading transposed pitches all the time is a little bit strange. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's readable, but you just have to tell your brain to interpret everything differently. One last thing I would say is let me know if you intend... Like say, sometimes you're good at scoring A2, sometimes you're not telling me if this is going down to one player or two players, right? So maybe a bit more proofreading in that 
particular angle for your own your own final copies and so on. Anyway, but yeah, I just really enjoyed this score. Uh, yeah, yes, I know I'm picking it apart, and I'm and I'm telling you to rewrite this or that if you want a good effect on such and such an instrument and so on. But it still is just really exciting, and this nice big full-blooded scoring it really you know gives back to the listener, and that's pretty admirable, Johan. I I really enjoyed it a lot. And once again, really thinking, how would this orchestrator take on the 2022 orchestration challenge? So watch this space for the next 10 months. <laughs> and then uh, let's go on to our final entry in this collection of really, really great scores. Right, Brandon, what a fun way to finish this uh, this set of entries. And I will have a lot to say about certain things. Probably some things you're looking at now in your score and saying, Oh, no, why did I do that? And maybe also following along a little bit and, and hearing a lot of my admonishments to other orchestrators in this challenge. And I, I really am hoping that everybody who has got a score in each of these videos is watching all the other evaluations and what I had to say about them. So, okay, the first thing to talk about, and you know, at the risk of turning into an advertisement for Note Performer, is have you heard about Note Performer? <laughs> it's cheap. I think it was a hundred and. So 130, 140 bucks or something like that. I'll have to look up the price. Uh, U.S. I think, um, maybe cheaper. And it, you know, it, it doesn't take up very much RAM, and it has a fairly realistic sound. I mean, good enough for a mock-up. I mean, obviously not the same as uh, as what you would get in in say you know working everything's at, working everything out on a DAW and being really professional about it but you know it's a really cheap workable option okay the problem is as you can kind of hear a lot of your massive textures sound very organ like right and that's because the sound set that you're using just has a tendency it's it's, it's a little careless about about the overtones of the different sounds that it is using and like they they tend to stack up and kind of turn into this very organ sounding kind of uh, these kind of, these organ sounding sort of overtones um, the other thing too is that I mean you certainly should be able to have a better harp sound than that and Celesta sound and, and xylophone sound right that this all sounds very um, almost Casio like right now, sorry, I don't mean to be dissing your <laughs> your sound set. If you really like your sound set, I apologize. I don't I don't mean to be uh, giving it too much negativity. Okay, so let's talk about a few scoring things. Okay, um, now you you've already heard me talk about the um, you know how audible is the harp in massive scoring, and it just isn't right. Now, right, right here, like, you've got nothing going on but pizzicato, staccato winds, and a bit of melody in your flutes and xylophone. So right in here, this could come through really well, but I would still want everything to be marked down dynamically. Like, your dynamics are, are pretty much just, you know, you've got this one little moment right in here, but otherwise the, the fortissimo button is pretty much on for the, you know, for most of this arrangement. So I would say if you were to, to drop the dynamics here, uh, you know, maybe down to say mezzo forte, then and then kept the harp and the celesta at forte, or fortissimo even, then there's a chance of it being heard. Now, this is kind of a strange thing about celesta. Maybe I could also throw this into the uh, into the ottava uh, 
tips bag, and that is the thing about Atava and Celeste is that the Celeste is already Atava, right? So uh, this G sharp, as written, will be the highest possible G sharp on the piano, right? So if you keep going, you run into notes that are not playable. C sharp, D, and so on, they're all out of range. This C right here is the top C on the piano, right? So I would say just leave out the Atava. Don't worry, you know, like I like I said in the previous uh, in, in my previous evaluation in this group, uh, there is a there are consequences to scoring very, very high notes. And you might as well just, you know, with especially with like flute and violin is, is just leave them, you know, leave those consequences uh, in place because that way everybody knows that this is going to be, you know, this is really going to cost something, especially the, the orchestrator, right? When they see that big stack of ledger lines and thinks, wait, wow, how, the, how are those people going to play that? They will know that that will be possibly an issue. People will have to practice that up. It might sound really screechy at the top for certain instruments, might end up being out of range if they're not thinking on a, uh, like if they stuck an ottava over a flute part and they went up to E and F, right? Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the scoring right in here. Um, yeah, you got your three flutes, oboe, yeah, you got one clarinet and one bassoon and so on. I feel like you could have had two oboes, right? There's, there's nothing about your third flute part that couldn't have been an oboe part and sounded just perfectly fine, right? And, and it would also cut down on the sort of organ-like sound. Um, Part of the part of the thing that sounds not organ-like <laughs> about the wind section is the fact that uh, you have instruments with so many different kinds of overtones all working together, right? But like triple flutes and then kind of one of everybody else, uh, you know, we're you know with a with a a sound set that doesn't really care so much about those things. That's when you end up sounding organ like so if you if you want to avoid that and but you can't change your sound set then i would say just watch out for asking things like three flutes and so on because it's, it really is like a you know like a like an organ stop like the flute stop on an organ it at least with that you know with this particular sound set yeah so you know Yeah, some of this, I would say, look at some scoring about how three parts per staff are handled. It would almost be better here if you had a separate staff for your third flute. I think it just would be a lot clearer. You know, if the third flute is doing a lot of things that are different and it's just easier to read. You know what I mean? The same thing would be true if you had like three trumpets. Uh, oftentimes the third trumpet is stuck on uh, its own staff just to make things a little clearer on the copyist, on the conductor, and so on, the score reader. Okay, so let's apply the evaluation criteria. Okay, because I think I'm I'm getting a little bit too hung up on little points of, um, little sort of points of notation and so on. So pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano being transcribed onto the orchestra is not an issue. You have a big, broad uh, picture here. Um, thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive. If orchestrated the exact same way twice, or the exact same way all the way throughout. So, I mean, you don't really do that. You know, you have you have different approaches between the first section and the second section that is repeated in the piano score. Oh, two more orchestra, uh, excuse me, two more notation points. This is great. Upward roll, downward roll, right? But if it were all upward rolls, then you don't use the upward roll mark, you just use the standard roll mark, right? The only reason to use the upward roll mark is to differentiate it from a downward roll mark, right? That's an actual tip in 100 more orchestration tips. Um, the other thing that is worth noting here is I, I try to use like the letter O rather than the harmonic 
O. I mean, it, it, it kind of all means this means the same thing. You want an open string, right? But I just try to, you know, I try to sort of differentiate it a little bit when there's if there's any possibility of it being mistaken for a harmonic, right? So just kind of using the open string, of course, there. I mean, how could you get, you know, how could you play that as a harmonic? But all the same, I just I just like the, you know. You know, if the if you if the eye is just moving quickly over the part and just glancing over it, I think, yeah, I think that, you know, pretty much that works a little bit better. This is the kind of thing where I would actually switch the parts. I would want my first violinist to be playing this and my second violinist to be playing this support part. I think it just would work a lot better to have this in the forefront, you know, right next to the audience. Now, just speaking of, like, how are all of these parts working? I like the little bits of, you know, you've gotten a few little bits of counterpoint in here. I think that those are, those are pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, I think sometimes the, the, the texture is a little inconsistent. Like, you know, right in here you have a teeny bit of, you know, you've got first flute, and then you've got your uh, clarinet right in here doubling the cellos. And, you know, and then you just have the firsts and the first flute going yep, up, up, up. And just, you know, this joins in. It's a little contrapuntal, but then we have the same sounding C and E. Yeah, and then, then right in here, the texture gets fuller, right? Um, oboe doubling the firsts, and then the winds on top, and so on, and then throwing in timpani and 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 so on. I, yeah, I mean it's, and then right in here, like really high clarinets and low bassoon, and not much going on in the strings, but horns in the middle, and then sort of bringing everybody in again. So it's just you just that overall. Yeah, the overall consistency of the of the of the parts are not always as clear as they could be. Um, so I would just say, like, just kind of watch out for some of that. Um, okay, but let's move on to the 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 whole question of the um, melodic development soaring quite high and so on. And here it's it's a little strange, like fortissimo diminuendo to mezzo forte, and here diminuendo to piano, in some parts. So I mean, are you doing this just because you want this to speak out on top? But I mean, if you do that, then you lose the support from below of the other instruments. So maybe the dynamics could be more consistent across all instruments here. And do you, if you know what I mean, maybe the uh, dynamics could follow the contours of the melody, you know, bum 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 ba da 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 right? Instead of da 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 you know what I mean? It's so it's it's you just just really have to ask yourself, is that the exact dynamic that I want there? And then the other question is like dropouts, right? So bum 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 or I hear you're going dun 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 da 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 da. You still will feel the drop out of the texture in here of the horn being absent, right? Because it's it's such a prominent sound in here. It'll be this. It'll be the loudest sound in here, and then it's gone, right? And then coming back, there isn't anything with the same kind of strength leading into these bashing horns right in here. But yeah, I mean, as far as the, yeah, I mean, I, I like the sort of the semi-contrapuntal and then the harmonization and all those other kinds of things. You know, pretty, pretty nicely done. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you don't have a piccolo or anything in here, so it, you basically just sort of compensate for different lines and so on. So, I mean, more or less, it's kind of actually a nice little 
little audio illusion in here. The the audio the the ear will sort of feel a little bit like the uh, the melody is cresting over the top and then going on. Yeah, I'm just not so sure about these flutes. See, like I feel that this we're getting into serious organ sounding territory right in here, and then like these. Um, C octaves here, these just massive C octaves in the in the um, lower heavy brass are are going to be giving you some of that, right? And you know, bump 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 bump. You know, what where what is the melody note here? It's it's supposed to be you know e e e ba da 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 dum bum 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 bum. Right, so I'm just really not quite. You've changed things around quite a bit, in other words. But I mean, I do like the the shifts between textures. That's kind of cool. You really are slamming that downbeat hard. All right, and then, but but I mean, I don't feel that this is this is necessarily relentless. It's just very very it's very pungent, right? And there are a lot of similar functions going throughout the the winds and the and the strings you know bump 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 so like that just hitting this f over and over and over again in all the parts is is also contributing to the kind of organ like sound and yeah, bump, 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 bump. this is actually really kind of fun the way that this is all scored i think the celesta and the harp are, are going to be fairly inaudible right in here but I mean, yeah, but just a really neat score. Um, yeah, I think that this is this feels like it's leading somewhere solid, right? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a once again, like there are a lot of these scores in this. Uh, most of the scores in this group have a lot of variation, and so on. But I, I get the feeling that the the. Um, your sound set is kind of not really telling you the truth about the way things sound. And I think that that would probably affect your decisions quite a bit, right? Um, but, I mean, it, it does really have some cool mo moments right in here. Uh, you have to think, though, like the overtones from Horns Atu playing in this way. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, with just a single flute above, right? How how strong would that really be? I would, would the flute be enough to, would the flute just get swallowed by the, you know, by the overtones from the horns? So I think a lot of those things would clear up with a, with a different, you know, like with something different to check your, you know, to check your, the possible textures and so on. Um, last little comment would be about the xylophone and the xylophone, kind of as the mock-up is playing it, is actually fairly quiet. You know, it could, it could be, um, it could be a lot louder than it is. And then, like, what comes through is sort of deceptive. It's not really a xylophone sound at all. You know, it's it's almost more like a kind of an electronic, uh, like almost like a Casio sound or something like that. And uh, the actual truth is that the that the xylophone in here, the way that you have scored it, would be very loud. It would be very powerful, and it would have a tendency to take over the music. Like, uh, you know, like anywhere that it played a kind of a counter melody or, or variation on the melody, it would have a tendency to make the music about it, and the actual melody would be would become secondary, right? So, bum 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 da 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 you know that would that would be that would end up being louder than anything except for the horn below, right? So this would this would get in the way of what's going on in the upper wind, and some of what's going on in here. But I I, I love these little isolated touches, you know, yum 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 plunk, right? Just hitting that xylophone hard, and then right in here, I, I would be concerned about the clarity of the little flute melody right in here with the xylophone right next to it. And of course, this will mess up our ability to hear the celesta and the harp because it will absorb the sounds of both instruments. You know, it, it, it has like the, the attack of 
you know, any of the attacks of the instruments in like the, whether it's the plucking of the harp or the, um, the, the little hammers hitting the bells in the celesta, that would get absorbed by the sound of the mallet hitting the, um, hitting the, the tone bar in the xylophone. So, so you've got to, you know, you've got that to work against, right? Right in here, you know, big rolled chords would be really awesome, though. I mean, there's, I'm not saying that, like, this isn't salvageable, it is, but you need to come back to it and rethink a few things, right? And maybe, like, as I said, change the, changing the sound set will change your perception of, of the way that certain pitches are stacking up and so on. But I mean, yeah, just like, just like all the other ones, just such a neat score. So... Um, I will just stop there before I keep digging too much into it. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want you to think that this wasn't a, a great entry. It really was. Um, there just was a lot to pick apart um, and a few fundamental things to touch on. Um, and, and it, you know, like sometimes when a score is like that, it I feel it brings out the best in me as a... Uh, as a mentor and uh, and a coach, so I really appreciate that um, that opportunity that you gave me, Brandon, and and I, I'm really you know enjoyed this, and just like everybody else, kind of wonder what the uh, what the results would be with this orchestrator and the 2022 entry. I'm almost getting more excited about now as I have uh, evaluated over a hundred scores at this point, and uh, and I'm sort of thinking ahead a year. So thank you to all of our six contributors to this collection and to all of our website subscribers and especially to the Patreon supporters who, you know, a lot of Patreon supporters are, um, they're subscribed to the channel, they are members on Facebook, of course they're supporting on Patreon, and uh, they're website subscribers and you know, everything else, they're on Twitter. And they're commenting on a lot of these videos. And so, you know, I just really feel like if everybody in this video could comment on each other's pieces, that would be great. And if we could keep the energy going on the feedback and comments and likes and other kinds of things, that would really keep me going, right? Uh, as, as we head towards the end of this period in our lives, this uh, set of evaluations because I, you know, for me, it'll be about a couple more weeks of, uh, of recording these. For you guys, it'll be maybe about three weeks, uh, three to four weeks of releases. So just like this is really keeping me going. Please continue to, you know, jump in and get involved and enjoy it and make those comments because they're really helping me. And, and I read every single one of them and everybody's being so fair and so kind and, and so intelligent in their suggestions and everything else. So, so it's working so far. So keep it going. All right. So thanks again, everybody. And I will see you with another collection very, very soon.